Income tax 2023-2024. Child and dependent care expenses credit. Can you claim the credit? Part number two. Get ready and some coffee because contrary to popular belief, you need a strong imagination for income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the Matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey's saying. So get one, because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. In publication 503, Child and Dependent Care Expenses Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're down on the bottom part of the income tax formula where the credits live. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Taxable income therefore basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula. But it's only half the battle, half the income tax equation. We have the second half, which is going to take that taxable income, calculate the tax on it. A little bit more complicated than you would think to do that, by the way, because we don't have a flat tax, but rather a progressive tax system. And some income is going to be subject to rates other than ordinary income rates, like possibly long-term capital gains qualified dividends but in any case that'll get us to the tax before credits and other taxes the tax liability basically this line indicating that we then have to take into consideration the credits and other taxes other taxes could include things like self-employment tax for a sole proprietor business and we have two lines where credits could live these are above or up top these are going to be the non-refundable type credits and then down here you've got another credit category with the payments that's because let's first think about the credits in general credits unlike deductions are a better than deductions typically because if you get a dollar of a credit you typically get that full benefit of the dollar if for example you have the tax liability to be able to consume it whereas if we got a dollar deduction that is just going to be a reduction to the taxable income our benefit depending then on the tax rates and brackets that we are in so the credits are typically better the non-refundable credits will typically not bring the tax liability below zero because if it did we're no longer have a tax but rather a benefit welfare type of system type of program a safety net program the the category of credits down here that are in the same area as the payments can take the liability below zero and therefore are basically using the tax code as a type of welfare or benefit program in those particular instances the most common credits down here being the child the additional child tax credit the refundable part of the child tax credit and the earned income credit for example and then we also have the payments so the payments the withholdings to the w-2s and the estimated payments to finally get to the tax refund or tax due so we're focused now on the child and dependent care uh, credit so this is the form 2441 that's going to be flowing through to the schedule 3 
additional credits and payments. Part number one, this is the non-refundable credits because this is a non-refundable credit component as opposed to a refundable credit, meaning not taking the tax liability below zero. Credit for child and dependent care expenses from Form 2441, line 11. That would then flow into the Form 1040, page number two that we're in, where we have the tax and credits, the non-refundable part, line 20, amount from the Schedule 3. All right, so we're continuing on with our discussion on this credit. We're now looking at the care of a qualifying person. What does that mean? So to work, uh, to be work-related, your expenses must provide care for a qualifying person. So remember, we're talking about a credit that is kind of related to the child, but we don't want to get it mixed up with a child tax credit. So just a quick recap. Child, if you have a qualify, if you have a dependent, the question is, do they qualify for a for a qualifying child? First, usually for a child tax credit is the first thing we are thinking about with regards to a dependent. If they do, great. If they don't, we might get an other dependent uh, credit, and then also we might have then a uh, dependent care expenses, which is what we're taking a look at now. And the benefit here is going to be tied to whether or not the expenses that we are paying are going to be freeing up our time so we can generate uh, revenue. That's kind of the idea or gist behind the credit. Also realize that a dependent could also have an impact on filing status for single people. One dependent possibly bringing up the filing status from single, the worst filing status, to uh, the head of household uh, filing status. Okay, so here we go. So you don't have to choose uh, the least expensive way to provide the care. So now we have to define what it is uh, for care, care of a qualifying person. So the cost of a paid care provider may be an expense for the care of the qualifying person, even if another care provider is available at uh, no cost. So in other words, now we have to say, well, the idea, the gist here is that we're providing, we're paying for care for the qualifying child so that we could work. Well, you would think, well, maybe the tax code is going to force me to pay the cheapest person. If I had someone available to care for the child, I should just use that option so that I can work. But obviously you want to have the highest care provider that you can get, or you don't want to have someone that's like at least abusive to the child or ignores the child or something like that. So you would think that there would be some leeway to choose the care provider. However, you can also imagine how people would abuse this law by say basically hiring a professional like musician to teach their child or something like that and try to write it off as as though it's a uh, it's care to help them to work. And in that case, no, it doesn't look like care. It looks like you're hiring them a very expensive tutor to train them in music or something. You know, I'm just making that as an example, right? So that so you can see where the laws are going to try. You would think to put some boundaries in there so that you have some leeway to, to have a qualified care provider, but aren't abusing the system by hiring someone to like train them in something that's going to be an expensive thing. And rather than simply providing care, so you can basically work. All right, expenses are for the care of a qualified person only if their main purpose is the person's well-being and protection. So again, it wouldn't be like their purpose is to train them in music or philosophy or whatever. So expenses for household services qualify if part of the services is for the care of qualifying person, the household services later. So if you have someone that you're hiring to care for the child, then obviously they might be doing more than just that. They might be caring for the home as well, which again gets kind of messy in terms of what part of the expenses are for the care of the child versus the other things that they might be doing at the same time basically or, or for the same pay that you're giving them on a whatever basis. Expenses not for care. So expenses for care don't include amounts you pay for food, lodging, clothing, education, and entertainment. So these are going to be things that you would think that you, you would be paying for, you know, anyways, and aren't specific to the care. The care you would think would be the money that you're paying to a person or an institution to take care of uh, the kids so you could work. However, you can include small amounts paid for these items if they are incidental and can't be separated from the cost of caring for the qualifying person. So you can see how this gets messy. You, you take the kid possibly to a care provider. The care provider provides lunch. 
Well, lunch is part of the fee that you're paying for the care provider, but food isn't something that you can include, include as an expense. But you would think it would be an incidental expense to the pain of the care providing facility, so you would think it would possibly be deductible, right? So otherwise, see the, the discussion under expenses part, uh, partly work-related later. So child support payments aren't uh, for care and don't qualify for the credit. So in other words, if you have a separated situation and one person is paying uh, the other spouse or ex-spouse or something like that, child support, that's not uh, qualified as care provision because you would think the other person is also the you know the the parent and whatnot and so so it's your ch so that would you would think that wouldn't qualify so in any case education expenses for a child in nursery school preschool or similar programs for children below the level of kindergarten are expenses for care so this is one of the more common kind of situations where this credit uh, could come up right so because you might have the option for nursery school uh, and preschool which could serve the option of possibly helping them with education, but possibly freeing up time as well for work, you would think. So expenses to attend kindergarten or a higher uh, grade aren't expenses for care. Uh, don't use these expenses to figure your credit. So now we're going, so we went from nursery school to preschool to uh, kindergarten here. And that's when you would think that it's no longer basically kind of optional because you kind of think in most places they're gonna be in the standard if they're in the public kind of school system at that point in time, which is part of the normal public school system. And I think the argument there would be that you have the option to put people in the public school system at that point, which means that you wouldn't be paying for the care. So then if they allowed you to pay for the care and deduct it, that they, they would be subsidizing, you know, private schools and whatnot or homeschooling and whatnot maybe. And that's not what they're, what they're trying to do with this particular credit, I guess. So however, expenses uh, for, uh, for before or after school care of a child in kindergarten or higher grade may be expenses for care. Now that would kind of make sense because again, you're kind of required to have the, the kid, if they went to public school, you would think that would be basically free, the public service, but the care after the public school then is something that you're doing so that they can, you can keep working possibly at that point in time and you would think you would have to pay for that so therefore you would think that might be deductible kind of makes sense summer school and tutoring programs aren't for care so again the summer school you would think that you're doing that to educate uh, the student and then and then uh, tutoring programs so again this kind of walks on the edge of certain things because obviously if you're having someone take care of the kid it's like well i would like them to learn something maybe you might as well be learning something while they're while they're sitting there instead of just putting them in front of the TV so they can be brainwashed or something. <laughs> but, you know, you can see why they're trying to separate the cost of like a high paying tutor or something like that uh, versus versus the cost to, to care just for the care is what they're trying to do. I, so example one. So you send your three year old child to a nursery school while you work. So the nursery school provides lunch and a few educational activities as part of its preschool uh, child care service. The lunch and educational activities are incidental to the child care and their cost can't be separated from the cost of care. You can count the total cost when you figure the credit. So the idea here being, yeah, you sent them for care there. They're not gonna just like sit the kid in front of the, front of the Disney channel or something so they can be brainwashed or something. They're actually gonna talk to them and whatnot <laughs> and they're gonna feed them. But those are incidental to the care. It's not like you paid them to teach the kid, you know, philosophy because you hired, you know, Plato or Aristotle, or, you know, to teach the kid or something, you know. So example two. So you are a member of the armed forces and you are ordered to a combat zone. All right, here we go with the combat zone again. To be able to comply with the order, you placed your 10 year old child in a boarding school. So only the part of the boarding school expenses that is for the care of your child is a work related expense. So you, you can count that part of the expense in figuring your credit if it can be separated from the cost of education. So now they have this situation where like, okay, you had to do this in order to, to deal with the combat pay situation, but there's an education component, which typically wouldn't be included. So they're going to say you have to kind of separate that education part out in the cost. 
So you can't count any part of the amount you pay for school for your child's education. We ain't paying for the education, dang it. Put them in front of the tube. Put them in front of the front of the Netflix or something. <laughs> care outside your home. So you can count on the cost of care provided outside your home if the care is for your dependent under age 13 or any other qualifying person who regularly spends at least eight hours each day in your home. So dependent care center. So now they're going somewhere else to a center for the dependent care. So you can count care provided outside your home by a dependent care center only if the center complies with all state and local regulations that apply to these centers. So usually you would think that if you're taking your kid to one of these centers, they would be well documented in terms of qualifying for these credits because that would be part of their advertisement strategy, you would think, and you shouldn't really have a problem in that case then typically to, to make sure that, that they give you the address and ID numbers and whatnot that you'll need for the tax preparation. If you're taking them to a center that is designed to take care of kids in this way and they aren't prepared in that format, you would think that they're not a very organized you know, center. So a dependent care center is a place that provides care for, and if they're not organized, I wouldn't take the kid to there. I would, I would think that would be self-explanatory, but I thought I'd point that out. So a dependent care center is a place that provides care for more than six persons, other than persons who live there, and receives fee, payment, or grant for providing services for any of those persons, even if the center isn't run for profit. So you have a camp. So the cost of sending your child to an overnight camp isn't considered a work-related expense. So typically, if you're sending your kid to the camp, you usually there's something, it's fun or something, they're, they're going there for some reason other than basically you can, so that you can work, right? You probably, if it's overnight camp, you're probably doing something other than working maybe at that night or something, I don't know. But the cost of sending your child to a day camp so maybe a work-related expense, even if the camp specializes in particular activity, such as computers or soccer. All right, example. So you send your nine-year-old child to a summer day camp while you work. The camp offers computer activities and recreational activities such as swimming and arts and crafts. So the full cost of the summer day camp may be for care and the cost may be work-related. Okay, and then example two, you send your 10 year old child to a math tutoring program for two hours per day during the summer while you work. The cost of tutoring program isn't for care and the costs are not considered work related. So see the general idea here is that you can teach the kid but it has to be like discreet. You don't wanna to be too, too out and open about, about the fact that they're learning stuff because then you might lose the credit. <laughs> Transportation. Okay, so if a care provider takes a qualifying person to or from a place where care is provided, that transportation is for care of the qualifying person. So now we've got the transportation costs, which can add a bit of a complication to the situation. So this includes transportation by bus, subway, taxi, or private car. So obviously we can calculate the bus and taxi and whatnot. The private car gets a little bit more complicated because obviously we're using that for other things as well. However, transportation not provided by a care provider isn't for the care of a qualifying person. So also, if you pay the transportation cost for the care provider to come to your home, that expense isn't the care of the qualifying person. So in other words, obviously if you send the kid to the place you would think the bus fee or whatnot might be a deductible component. But if they're coming to your place, then you're not going to be paying, you know, you're not going to include their transportation fees and whatnot, typically, although they might include that as part of the calculation of their fee for their services or so on. So fees and deposits. So fees you pay to an agency to get the service of a care provider depends uh, deposits uh, deposits you paid to an agency or preschool, application fees and other indirect expenses are work-related expenses if you have to pay them to get the care. So that would make sense even though they aren't directly for care. However, a forfeited deposit isn't the, isn't the care of a qualifying person if care isn't provided. Example, so you paid a fee to an agency to get the services for the nanny who cares for your two-year-old daughter while you work. 
The fee paid is a work-related expense, as you would expect. Example two, you placed a deposit with a preschool to reserve a place for your three-year-old child. You later sent your child to a different preschool and forfeited the deposit. The forfeited deposit isn't for care and therefore not a work-related expense. So the idea here being that what is a deposit might be part of the question. Obviously, if you're saying, I'm gonna give you a deposit to lock in the position so that my kid could go to that place uh, and they and they need and they and they need the deposit before they give the services. You give them the deposit, but then you decide to go somewhere else. Well, they're not going to give you the deposit back because you they already locked in the deposit, and the deposit is now not being applied to any services because they didn't take care of the kid, and therefore the IRS is saying it's not going to be part of a, a deductible expense. So household services. Expenses you pay for household services meet the work-related expense test if they are at least partly for well-being and protection of a qualifying person. So if you have someone doing household services, now they're coming to your home, then obviously they might be doing other things, but part of the work might be for qualifying, uh, caring for the kid. So definition, household services are ordinary and usual services done in and around your home that are necessary to run your home. So they include, for example, the services of cook, maid, babysitter, housekeeper, or cleaning person if the services are partly for the care of the qualifying person. However, they don't include services for a chauffeur, bartender, or a gardener. What? The bartender isn't, isn't part of child care? You know, they, they, they could... Oh my goodness housekeeper so in this publication the term housekeeper refers to any household employee whose services include the care of a qualifying person expenses partly are work related so if part of an expense is work related for either household services or the care of a qualifying person and part is for other purposes like the bartender you know you have a you have to divide the expenses so to figure your credit count only the part that is work related. However, you don't have to divide the expense if only uh, a small part is for other purposes. In other words, you would think you'd have to break out their bartender services from their uh, child care services and whatnot. Uh, but if the bartender services are basically incidental, which obviously they're not usually you can, you, because you know there's a lot of work be done serving, but because your kids are driving you crazy, you know, but uh, if it was incidental, then you would think that it would be like immaterial, and therefore uh, you could calculate, you don't have to break it out, you would think. Example, so you pay a housekeeper to care for your 9-year-old and 14-year-old child so you can work. The housekeeper spends most of the time doing normal household work and spends 30 minutes a day driving you to and from work. So you don't have to divide the expenses. You can treat the entire expense of the housekeeper as work-related because the time spent driving is minimal. That's the idea. So nor do you have to divide the expenses between the two children, even though the expenses are partly for the 14-year-old child and isn't a qualifying person because he's over, he's over the age limit. So because the expense is also partly for the care of the nine-year-old uh, who is a qualifying person. However, the dollar limit discussed later is based on one qualifying person, not two. So, okay, so then, so now you have to pay the same person to take care of the two kids, but only one kid qualifies for the, ex the deduction, but you would have to pay them to take care of that kid anyway. So you would think possibly you could still have the full amount instead of breaking it out between the two kids so that, so you'd only get to deduct half of it. But there's a dollar limitation, a cap on how much you can deduct. And even though you have two kids, only one of them qualifies. And therefore, you have to have the dollar limitation based on the one kid and not two kids, even though they're taking care of the two kids because the one kid is over the, doll, over the age limit. So meals and lodging provided for housekeeper. So if you have expenses for meals that your housekeeper eats in your home because of his or her employment, count these as work-related expenses. So feeding people is an expense. Instead of cash, they, get, they, 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 they raid the fridge or whatever, then, poss then that's still possibly a form of payment and possibly something you could deduct. So if you have extra expenses for providing lodging in your home to the house housekeeper, uh, count these work-related expenses also. 
Example, to provide lodging to the housekeeper, you move to an apartment with an extra bedroom. Uh, you can count the extra rent and utility expenses for the housekeeper's bedroom as work related. However, if your housekeeper moves into an existing bedroom in your home, you can count only the extra utility expenses as work related. All right, taxes paid on wages. So the taxes you pay on wages for qualifying child and dependent care services are work related expenses. Uh, for more information on, on household employers uh, tax responsibilities see do you have household employees later so so again this becomes kind of a messy situation if you're in a situation where you're hiring someone to basically work in your home because in that situation it's kind of weird because you're not actually an employer you're not doing a revenue generation activity but you're still directing someone to to as an as basically an employee managing the home which again isn't designed basically to generate revenue but is designed to basically have a, you know live well or whatever and you're directing someone basically as an employee and therefore you would think the irs wants you to treat the employee as an employee and therefore deal with the payroll taxes and whatnot and if you have to deal with social security and medicare then you're then they have part of the social security and medicare and you as the employer would have to deal with part of the social security and medicare and then on the personal side the question is what can you deduct the payroll taxes and whatnot that you had to pay that didn't come out of their check but out of your side uh with regards to the credit uh becomes a question if they're if they're not uh u.s citizens and they're not able to get social security benefits you have questions about whether or what, how, what are you going to do with the social security part of the wages and whatnot. So that you can dive into that, looking at the IRS website for, uh, do you have household employees and what are you going to do about that? So uh, payments to related or uh, relatives or dependents. So you can count work-related payments you make to relatives who aren't your dependents, even if they live in your home. So remember, that you would think the IRS isn't going to allow you to say, well, I'm going to pay my older dependent child to take care of my younger dependent child. The IRS will typically not want to do that because you already get a benefit from both of them because you're claiming them as a dependent and you might have paid them anyway in sal and just basically in uh, in their allowance or something. But if they're they're not a dependent, then you might be able to pay them for the child care, you would think. So, however, don't count any amounts you pay to a person for whom you or your spouse if filing jointly can claim as a dependent. So if they're dependent, you can't pay them for the services of taking care of the kids. You can just make them do it, right? So it's not. So your child, including stepchild or foster child who was under age 19 at the end of the year, even if he or she isn't your dependent. So that's basically the age limit for qualifying for a dependent if they're not a student right a person who was your spouse anytime during the year so you can't basically pay the spouse you would think so the parent of your qualifying person if your qualifying person is your child and under age 13. all right what's your filing status generally married couples must file a joint return to take the credits so if you're taking the credits you would typically have to be anything basically other than married filing separate, right? So if you're married, the, the government is skeptical of you filing married filing separate, and you may lose access to certain deductions, including this one, if you do that. However, if you are legally separated or living apart from your spouse, you may be able to file a separate return and still take their credit. So in other words, if you're married, then it comes to the question of, well, how can you get out? How can you go back to single or head of household? Well, you'd have to get divorced or separated, which typically comes to the state law, but the federal government might, for federal income tax purposes, be able to define separation for those purposes, in which case you can then say, well, we're not technically married possibly for federal income taxes, and then maybe go into the head of household filing status. All right, legal, so you could take a look at those kind of... Uh, wonky situations we've talked about in prior presentations with separations so legally separated now here we go you aren't considered married if you are legally separated from your spouse under a decree of divorce or separate maintenance 
so you may be eligible to take the credit on your return using head of household filing status in that case. Married and living apart, so you aren't considered married and are eligible to take the credit if all the following apply. You file a return apart from your spouse, so you're not going to file a joint return. Your home is the home of a qualifying person for more than half the year. So you have basically a dependent moving you up from single filing status to head of household because you're basically saying you're not married anymore because you're separated. So you pay more than half the cost of keeping up your home for the year and uh, your spouse doesn't live in your home for the, for the last six months of the year. Example one. So any separa uh, Amy separated from her spouse in March. She isn't separated under a decree or divorce separate maintenance agreement and uses the married filing separate filing status. So now she's, she's basically separated, but she's now she filed as, as married filing separate rather than trying to say I'm separated and filing like as a head of household. So Amy maintains a home for herself and Sam, her disabled brother. Sam is permanently and totally disabled and unable to care for himself. So because Sam earns $5,600 in interest income, Amy can't claim him as a dependent. Uh, his gross income is greater than $4,700. And uh, because Amy isn't able to claim Sam as a dependent and she's still married as of the end of the year, she can't use the head of household filing status. So Amy's filing status is married filing separately and Sam qualifies as a qualifying person for the child and dependent care credit. So that's somewhat of an unusual situation. All right, because of the following facts, Amy is able to claim the credit for child and dependent care expenses even though Amy uses the married filing separate filing status, which isn't typically the case, right? So Amy didn't live with her spouse for the last six months of the year. So uh, she has maintained a home for herself uh, and Sam, a qualifying person, since she separated from her spouse in March. She maintains her own uh, household and provides more than half of the cost of maintaining that home for her and Sam. And Amy pays an adult care center to care for Sam to allow her to work. All right, example number two, Dean separated from his spouse in April. He isn't separated under a decree or divorce or separate maintenance agreement, which is what you would think would be the separation under the state law, right? Would be gen the general idea, but you still maybe for tax purposes for the federal taxes could be separate. It's kind of the idea here. So he and his spouse haven't lived together since April and Dean maintains his own home and provides more than half the cost of maintaining that home for himself and his daughter, Nicole, who is permanently and totally disabled. That is sad because Nicole is married and files a joint uh, return with her husband who is away uh, in the military. Dean can't claim Nicole as a dependent and therefore can't use the head of household filing status. So Dean's filing status is married filing separately and Nicole qualifies as a qualifying person for the child and dependent care credit. All right. So because of the following facts, Dean is able to claim the credit for child and dependent care expenses, even though he uses the married filing separate filing status, which is typically uh, something that's going to cause you not to be able to claim the credit, but he's in the exception category. Dean didn't live with his spouse for the last six months of the year. So he has maintained a home for himself and Nicole, a qualifying person, since he separated from his spouse in April. He maintains his own household and provides more than half of the cost of maintaining that home for him and Nicole. Dean pays a daycare provider to care for Nicole to allow him to work. So cost of keeping up a home, what does that even mean? So the cost of keeping up a home normally include property taxes, mortgage interest, rent, utility charges, home repairs, insurance on the home, and food eaten at home. The cost of keeping up a home don't include payments for clothing, education, medical treatment, uh, vacations, life insurance, transportation, or mortgage principal. So they, they also don't include the purchase permanent improvement or replacement of property. For example, you can't include the cost of replacing a water heater. However, uh, you can include the cost of repairing a water heater. All right, what happens if there's a, a death of a spouse situation? 
So if your spouse died during the year and you don't remarry before the end of the year, which is typically the case, uh, you must generally file a joint return to take the credit. So clearly, if someone dies, if you have a married filing joint situation, and then someone dies uh, that year, one of the spouses die, then you typically are still going to be filing married filing joint for that year. And then in the following years, the question is, do you revert back to a uh, head of household status or single status or possibly qualified widow, widower status. So if you do remarry before the end of the year, the credit can be claimed on your de uh, deceased spouse's own return. Uh, care provider identification test. So you must identify all persons or organizations that provide care for your child or dependent. So clearly this is part of the requirements. You have to, you're have you basically getting something similar to a deduction, a tax benefit. And if you get the tax benefit, you have to write out, you have to write out who you gave the money to so the IRS can go after them for the taxes that they got on the income side, you would think. So use form 2441 part one to show the information. So if you don't have any care providers and you are filing form 2441 only to report taxable income in part three, enter none on line one, column A. Information needed uh, to identify the care provider, you must give the provider's name, address, and taxpayer identification number. So obviously if you take them to, to another care provider facility, then they will clearly have this information as an organization that provides care. So if it was like a preschool or something like that, they should have that information ready. If it's going to be a person, then of course you have to give that person's basically name, address, and social security number, uh, in essence, you would think. So if the care provider is an individual, the taxpayer identification number is his or her social security number or an individual taxpayer identification number. If they're an individual, they could still have one of those because they might have like their own business, like a Schedule C business, in which case they don't want to give out their social security number. So they've applied for an EIN number, even though they don't have employees in that situation, possibly. So if the care provider is an organization, then it is the employer identification number. So I'm sorry, if it's an organization, then you've got the EIN number. If it's an individual, it would be the social security number. And then possibly they might not have a social security number, but an individual tax uh, payer identification number. In that case, possibly if they if they weren't like a U.S. Uh, citizen, for example. So you can't. So you don't have to show the taxpayer identification number if the care provider is a tax exempt organization, such as a church or school. And these care uh, case enter tax exempt in the space where Form 2441 asks for the number. So in that case. The IRS isn't as concerned about it because they can't go after them for taxes because they're tax exempt on the income side of things. So if you can't provide all the information or the information is incorrect, you must be able to show that you used due diligence I discussed earlier in trying to furnish the necessary information. So clearly, if you're taking your kid to a care provider, you want to make sure that they have that information available. If they don't, you would think they're not really that responsible and it might not be the place you want to go. But if you're at the end of the year and you can't get that information, you've tried to get it, if you can show that you've done the due diligence, then you can possibly still take the deduction. And if they come after you with an audit, you'd have to show that you did your due diligence to try to get that information. So getting the information. So you can use Form W-10. You can find that on the IRS website to, to request this information. So giving them like a W-10 similar to like a W-4 for an employee when they first get a job to fill out uh, for the employer. So the W-10 to request the required information from the care provider. So if you don't use Form W-10, you can get the information from one of the other sources listed in the instructions for Form W-10, including a copy of the provider's social security card, a copy of the provider's completed Form W-4. So this would be in the case of the, if they're working for you as a household employee, a W-4, employees withholding certif certificate if he or she is your household employee, a copy of the statement of furnished by your employer, if the provider is your employer's dependent care plan, or a recently printed letterhead or invoice that shows the provider's name, address, 
and T-I-N. Due diligence. What does that even mean to do my due diligence? I tried. I tried. I sent out an email uh, to the wrong place and it bounced back back. It bounced back at me and then and then I quit. That's not really do. I don't think that's going to fly in the audit. So if the care provider informed you uh, information I gave give uh, is incorrect or incomplete, your credit may not be allowed. However, if you can show that you used due diligence in the trying to supply the information, you can still claim the credit. So you can show due diligence by getting and copying the provider's completed form W-10 and one of the other sources of information just listed. So care providers can be penalized if they don't provide this information to you or if they provide incorrect information. So if, if you could say, hey, look, I sent them out the W-10 and they didn't give it to me. I tried to look up their information using other sources. I couldn't get it. So then the IRS uh, could go after the care provider and say, okay, you guys are looking scammy over here. Uh, what's going on? So provider refusal. So if the provider refuses, just refuses to give you the identification information, you should report form 2441, whatever information you have, such as the name and address. Enter C attached statement in the columns calling for the information uh, you don't have. So, so you can add another attachment to the tax return, basically saying, hey, look, I did my due diligence. This attached statement explaining that you've requested the information from the care provider, but the provider didn't give you the information. But sure to write, be sure to write the name and social security number on this statement. The statement will show that you used due diligence in trying to furnish the necessary information. U.S. citizen and resident aliens living abroad. So if you are living abroad, your care provider may not have and may not be required to get a U.S. taxpayer identification number, for example, a social security number. So if you're living abroad, they're not going to have a valid U.S. identification number because they're not in the U.S. and they don't need the number. So if so, uh, enter LAFCP, Living Abroad Foreign Care Provider, in the space for the care provider's taxpayer identification number.